You're listening to the Grazing Grass Podcast, episode 98. Those cows have four feet in their mouth and they can harvest that themselves. You don't need to make the hay. <laughs> You're listening to the Grazing Grass Podcast, helping grass farmers learn from grass farmers. Where every episode features a grass farmer, their operation, and their regenerative practices. I'm your host, Cal Hardage. On today's episode, we have Russ Wilson of Wilson Land and Cattle Company. Russ took time out of his busy speaking engagements and farm activities to hop on and share about his journey and what he's doing on his farm. I think you'll really enjoy as we talk about the transition from doing it conventionally with cattle to where he is now, including multi-species. Before we talk to Russ, 10 minutes or 10 seconds about my farm, and we're not going to talk about my farm this week. The wildfires in Texas, I have not seen a report today, but hopefully with the weather change, they're, they're gaining containment. I know there's lots of people out there needing lots of help. The West Texas area that over a million acres have been burnt is where my grandparents moved from to Oklahoma. So my dad still has cousins that live out there in ranch and none of them are a, none of them had a total loss but they did incur some losses if you feel led to help out some way get online look find somewhere where you can help let's talk to russ russ we want to welcome you to the grazing grass podcast we're excited you're here today Thanks for having me, Cal. It's an honor. Thank you, Russ. To get started, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your operation? Yeah, I've been involved in agriculture pretty much my whole life, but I grew up in conventional agriculture in small dairy, and we we sold those cows in eighteen or yeah in nineteen eighty nine, <laughs> nineteen eighty nine, just because it just wasn't profitable. And then I punched time clock for a while and. Then I started my own businesses. I've had several businesses along the way. And, and then in 2008, my wife and I, we decided to get a few cows just to raise some meat for ourselves. And it just spiraled from there. I started as conventional and, and that wasn't working for us at all. What caused you to change? Bottom line, I wasn't making any money. Uh, having businesses in the past, business needs to make money as far as I'm concerned. And at the end of the year, I was writing big checks and uh, not making any money. So that was my main reason for changing. During that time, were you looking at more regenerative practices or rotational grazing? How did you get on that subject to, to think, hey, this is going to help me be more profitable? Well, Cal, back whenever I was transitioning, I didn't know what regenerative agriculture was. To me, it was more about taking the inputs out of the farm so I could actually try and make a profit. So that's what pushed me along, is to try and get all those inputs out. Because we were making a lot of hay and uh, planting corn and uh, grinding it and, you know, the steps it takes. And, you know, we got rid of all that stuff. So you mentioned you were farming ground at the time as well? Yeah, yeah. My farm... Uh, it's just about all tillable. There's very little of it that's not tillable. Um, and we had, I don't know, I'd say around seven acres of pasture field and uh, we farmed the rest of it. We'd make as much hay as we could and we'd make grain and uh, or grow corn and oats and feed that back to the cows. And it just wasn't working. I agree. The, the regenerative term is, is newer but mm -hmm. we came to it under the same deal. We got to make more money. And what's one way to keep more money in your pocket? Let's reduce those inputs. Oh, yeah. And that's a pathway for many people, I think. Mm -hmm. And then it just gets, you start finding out information, you just go deeper. Regenerative and, and lower inputs just go hand in hand um, once you sit down and look at it. At least for us, it does. Our, our cattle are still, our, our mama cows are still out grazing. We haven't fed any hay at all to those girls yet this year. Oh, yes. And were you able to 
just on that topic of winter grazing, were you able to do that by stockpiling or did you plant some cover crops in? We're getting away from planting the cover crops and the annuals and stuff as the farm gets better. We just basically working off stockpile cool season grasses or cool season pastures. We're not, I try to have as much diversity as we possibly can. And when you think about your pastures, just before we talk about your pastures a little mm -hmm. bit more, where are you located? I'm in northwestern Pennsylvania, just south of the Lake Erie snow. Normally get about 40 inches of rain and then about 100, 100 to 120 inches of snow a year. And this year, I don't think we've had 18 inches of snow this year. It's been a dry winter. We've had a lot of rain, I guess you could say. Just not in snow form. No. So when I'm watching the weather forecast and they're saying lake effect snow, that's going, that's mainly north of you. You're just barely to the south of that. Yeah. I'm about maybe 10, 15 miles south of that. So we do get lake effects every once in a great while. So when you're mainly using your pasture there and when you started this in 2008, what did your pastures look like? Basically bare ground. They were basically sacrifice paddocks. It, we were only grazing maybe 100 days a year. And the rest of it we were feeding for the rest of the year. And it just, you know, you, you drive across the country, you see these pastures that are basically big sacrifice lots. So what was your first step to get away from that? I had a lot of turning points or people that kind of planted the seeds. Uh, and one was the veterinarian I had. We were on a first name basis with our vet there for a while and we were doing things conventional because we were calving in February, March, and we had a lot of sickness, hoof rot, you name it, we had it. And he drove in the, in the, the farm there one spring day, it was in April, and, and he looked at me and he says, why aren't your cows out there grazing? And I said, no, I need to make the hay on it. He says, no, those cows have four feet in the mouth and they can harvest that themselves. You don't need to make the hay. <laughs> that was one of the, the people that kind of planted the seed to make me start thinking a little bit. Did that piece of advice spur you into motion right then to change, or did you have to hear it a few more times? I had another gentleman come in and when he first came in, I thought he was crazy. He was a USDA NRCS grazing specialist. He came in, I was trying to get rid of, I didn't like to see those bare pastures or those muddy pastures, and I didn't know what to do. So I had him come in, and he walked the farm, and I told him what I was going to do, and, and he suggested that I start rotating my cows once a day. And <laughs> When he he said that, I thought he was crazy. I didn't tell him that, but oh, yeah. I went up to my wife after he left, and I'm like, this guy's nuts. Why would we want to move those cows once a day? And him and I, we've become really good friends. Any questions or anything I had, I, we bounced things off of each other, and we, have, we had, and ended up having a good working relationship. And I assume when you look at those early pastures or when you think about those early pastures, set stock, you weren't dealing with much infrastructure outside of a perimeter fence. No. Actually, I had three fences. I had two broken down barbed wire fences, and then I had a rebar with screw-on insulators as my main, a single wire of, as my main fence. But yeah, oh, yeah. I, I did. My fencing was horrible. So what did you do once you started getting this feedback? Where did you go for more knowledge or did you um, get a couple of people telling you you jumped in? I get up early in the mornings and I don't like to work out in the dark. And I have. I, I've used headlights and different things like that. But getting up at two thirty, three o'clock in the morning, that gives me the opportunity to do research. Every day three, four hours a day, just trying to get this figured out and which way to go and how can we lower the inputs. And it's a lot of fun. I really enjoy it. I love easing into my day. Mm -hmm. I like to get up early, not as early as you're talking about, but right. I like to get up, have my coffee, check out YouTube for the channels I follow. Mm -hmm. and, and I browse the web, try and find some information. And that's my morning routine as mm -hmm. much as I can keep it a routine. Oh, yeah. And I also read a lot, 
so I have a lot of textbooks and stuff that or a lot of reading material that I've been, and there's some really good grazing magazines out there as well. Oh, yeah. That was 08, you got the a few cows. When did you really make a switch? We started rotating once a day in the fall of 2011. Oh, yes. And did you jump immediately to once a day rotations or did you do a yeah, yeah, few I, steps in between there? No, I was going, I was on a seven to 14 day rotation. I thought that was rotational grazing. And, and actually I can show you the cow trails that are still left in those fields from 2011 today. Oh yeah. Yeah. Those cow trails just never go away. But in 2000, a fall of 2011, my wife and I started moving the cows once a day and it was overwhelming to be quite honest with you. It took her and I uh, an hour and a half a day to move those cows once a day when we first started. Yeah, it was a lot of work. Yes. Were you putting up poly braid and moving them? How were you? How were? How was? How were? I don't even know if it's a was <laughs> or a were now. Now my yeah. middle school English teacher is right. I don't know was and were. <laughs> how did that go for you at the beginning? How? Or what materials were you using? Um, I went and I, I bought some mini reels and I went and I got the cheapest poly twine that I could find. And I started out with rebar posts with screw on insulators. Oh, yes. And it's because I already had those and we just started from there. And I was still, I would rotate the cows, but I'd also leave alleyways so they could get back to water. And all that has changed now, but that's how we first started out. Yeah, th that water is always a, a tough call in the beginning. You've got to leave them some way to get back to water. Yeah, water's the, the biggest problem on all farms. I want to go out and visit other farms. It's not the fencing, it's the water. Water's the biggest issue. The cows you had in 08, have you just continued with the same cows, same breeding? or No, we changed our breeding. <laughs> We and we had cows that was pushing 1,900 pounds. Um, oh, wow. They were big. They were big hippos. And whenever I bought the cattle, I tried to buy the highest EPD cattle that I could find, mm -hmm. not realizing that the, usually the higher EPD cattle don't necessarily do well on grass. I went and I found a very small frame. We're, we're working with registered Angus. And I went oh, and I yes. found an old line of Angus with a small frame bull, I think he was like a two and a half, maybe a three frame score. And I put him on the cows and that's how we brought our hurt, our frames down on the cows. We didn't wear cows yet this year, but last year the average weight was a thousand seven pounds. Oh yes. So there, there are a lot, we have a whole different herd than what we used to. Oh yeah. And when you, in 2011, how far were you on that journey then? We were just getting start on the cattle side. We were still back at the beginning. Oh, you you were still grazing those larger animals. Yeah, we were still grazing those larger animals. And then I would say in 2012, 2013, I realized that we needed to do something different. And I needed to get an old school genetics before they were upsized oh, yeah. for show, show stock. A lot of those larger framed animals are for for feedlot situation. They don't do as well on grass. I have a Ingus breeder not too far from me. In fact, for a number of years, they had cattle that bordered us. And, oh, their bulls are huge. Mm -hmm. We didn't have necessarily small cows mm -hmm. a few years ago. We had smaller cows because we were on, were on that journey downsizing our cows as well mm -hmm. to a more moderate size. But we weren't near as, as big as... Those Angus were, and we had limousine, which Those are decent sized limousine. Yeah. But we'd been really careful and trying to get a moderate sized docile mm -hmm. limousine for years at that point. But those Angus bulls across the fence were huge. Yeah. They weren't always across the fence. <laughs> you talked about that initial getting started with that once a day moving of your cattle. You still had bigger cattle. It was a lot of work to get started. Did yeah. you immediately see some benefit from it? Absolutely. Or were you just having to go by faith? No, absolutely. I seen results almost immediately. We were moving once a day. We were putting a back fence on them so they weren't 
going back and nipping the tips off and the regrowth was just tremendous um just by moving them once a day oh yeah and yeah it, it the, the results are almost immediate there was no question that we were doing something but we didn't know quite what yet right yeah and you mentioned there before you did that once a day you were on a weekly or two week rotation yeah what would you say to someone who's doing that kind of weekly rotation to encourage them to go to? I wouldn't recommend anybody to go straight to a daily rotation. Take smaller steps. If you're doing a weekly rotation, maybe go every three to four days and move and just slowly work your way up. Because at least for me, it got overwhelming. It, and a lot of times the stuff overwhelms you, you're going to just quit. And but you don't want to quit. Just keep at it. And I, I think that's a valid point there. Mm. Uh, and as we talked about before the podcast, say take that next step, yeah, wherever that may be. So right. if you're on weekly rotation, if you can go three or four days, just yeah. step it up. Yeah. yeah. Because you currently you're not doing once a day rotations. No, currently for the most part we're we're moving twice a day. The soils dictate what the rotation's going to be for those livestock because we don't only have cows we have sheep and donkeys and hogs and chickens and stuff we have all classes of livestock and whatever i feel the soil needs is dependent on how many times we move and if it's really wet out we may move the cows 10 times in a day oh yeah and we haven't done that because of the soils have built themselves up to where and i've learned a lot in grazing in wet weather and the soils have built themselves to the point where, you know, maybe four to five times a day is usually max for us now. And, and like I say, the field's going to dictate how many times we move, but most generally it's at least twice a day. Oh, yeah. And are you dealing with same type of soil throughout your farm? Or you have a few different types. No, that's a great one, Cal, because when we first started on our farm, we were working off the, the web soil survey, and work. I got to working with the NRCS pretty close, and they sent a soil scientist in to just look at the soils and how we've improved them and stuff. And he, the soils that you're saying here, are, that isn't what they are. He actually remapped my farm, and uh, oh yeah, he he was qualified to do that. So he remapped my farm and. Uh, I'm working with seven different soils on 135 acres and about 40% of my farm is wetland soil. And, oh yes. And, and if you look at the web soil survey, it's not recommended for agricultural use. And, and that's what it, it was. It was, I got a lot of swampy areas and I have some fields that almost every field I have has a, a wet spot in it. Oh yeah. Yeah. Just, Talking about that soil type and going on with those wet areas, mm -hmm. how do you manage those differently? When I go out and talk to folks, I, I tell them, graze your wet soils when it's dry and graze your dry soils when it's wet. You may move cows from one side of the farm to the other just because of that. Um, uh, we don't have a set rotation for those animals. They're, they go where they're needed. And uh, I have fields that I'll graze half of them off and then I'll come back after it dries and, and, and then we'll graze them then. Uh, so yeah, that's the best advice that I can give, and uh, we can talk about uh, paddock uh, size and stuff too. Um, your paddock shape makes a huge difference when you're grazing in the wet weather. Um, the square you can make those paddocks, the better or less compaction that you're going to have. And if you want to do a little more trampling, make those paddocks long and narrow. That, that's an area that I really hadn't thought about till last fall when I went to Noble Research Institute, Essentials mm -hmm. of Regenerative Grazing, mm -hmm. and they were talking about paddock size and amount of trampling mm -hmm. and changing that, whether it's a one-to-one one or three-to-one, four-to-one, or even a ten-to-one. Right. So that that's really in, interesting and great to point out that you can control how much walking and trampling is going to take place in that paddock, yeah, that paddock it, shape. And it, it makes a big difference. It really does. You mentioned that you may move your cattle across the farm. So do you have any 
interior fences that cause you any problems on pathways or are you doing uh, this all with polybraid? We're doing it all with polybraid. I do have a little bit of animal trails and walkways, but I didn't want a whole lot of stabilized areas because that's just areas that the grass isn't going to grow. Oh, yeah. So I've went with, I just set alleyways. We've mastered that setting fence. We can set a whole lot of fence in a little bit of no time. And here's an example. We have a lease property up the road. It's a mile and a half up the road from us. And we can set the fence, move the cows, and pull the fence in two hours, two of us. Oh, yes. And that's quite a bit of fence. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah, we, if you stick with it and try to improve, you can really learn how to set fence. And Before we... We talked a little bit more about other species and stuff, mm -hmm. watering systems. Early on, you were watering out of your ponds or streams. You've upgraded it. What was the process to upgrade it, and what do you have in place? What I did is I have an equip contract, and they helped with a little bit of my watering system. I would say maybe a quarter of our watering system they helped put underground lines in, and then they wanted me to put cement troughs in. Or, or rubber tire troughs, and I told them, no, we can't do that. So we put in all frost-free hydrants. And it ended up, I have about 12,000 feet of water line buried with 40-plus uh, hydrants. And, and I put that all in on my, on my own, and uh, I have hydrants about every 200 feet. Because I've seen the benefit of... Uh, moving the water tank and, and keeping a hose on them and just keeping those nutrients out where they need to be. Um, I could see when we used to water out of an old cast iron bathtub. Oh, yes. <laughs> That's what we watered out of. And I think ever since I was just a little guy, we always watered out of a, a old claw foot cast iron bathtub. But what I seen was when we were coming back to water at that point, we were moving a lot of manure and a lot of urine in towards that tank and in reality we needed to have those nutrients out where the grass can grow put all the hydrants in i have i have two that i think i have stabilized around the hydrant the rest of them are just hydrants in the ground with an upright post that they're screwed to to make sure the cows don't knock them over but we've since i just uh three step in posts around it and put a hot wire on them and I fence them all out as we go. And over the years, I've developed a, a valve for a tank that I call it a wee valve. What it does is you turn a little needle valve on and it leaves the water run, which brings that geothermal heat up into the tank and keeps it from freezing. And there's folks clear up in Saskatchewan, Canada, that are actually using this and tested that valve down at negative 35. Oh, and it worked well at that. Yeah, it worked well at negative 35, and that was a big game changer, being able to keep the cows out. We used to run them out for a half a day and bring them back in for a half a day so they could get watered, and now they just they stay out there. Tank are you using for watering your animals? <laughs> That's a great question, Cal. Our watering tank is a 55-gallon drum cut in half, okay? Oh, yes. It's, it's cut in half on the roundways and we only put about yeah. maybe 10 to 15 gallons in that tank and it has a high the valve is a high flow valve and we keep that tank within 200 feet of the livestock and in doing that only one or two animals come at a time to drink and we've actually watered 120 animal units out of that tank without any issues whatsoever oh, wow. and and doing that, what the great thing is with that small amount of water, especially in the summertime, whenever it's 100 degrees out, that water cycles through that tank, and that water coming out of the ground is 55 degrees. And, you know, I believe that helps keep their body temperature down and keeps them out grazing longer. I think you're right with that, or I think it potentially could be correct because mm. I'm not using that small a watering trough. Mm. I would love to, but mm. I don't have a good enough watering system yet. Yeah. Yeah, But uh, that water gets hot when it's setting out there. Yeah, it does. I, I've seen that. I started with 55-gallon uh, tanks, and even with the 55-gallon tank in the 100-degree days, you're looking at the water getting up to 110, 120 degrees. It oh, gets yeah. hot. And I wouldn't want to drink it, let alone let the cows do it. 
you know, as, as I tell my kids, if you're not willing to drink it, then you shouldn't be giving it to the livestock. Oh, yeah, yeah. When you you put in your lines, are they two-inch lines all pressurized, or um, did you go that big? No, I didn't have to go that big. I I have two springs, and I have a well, and they're pressurized. They're 2040, I believe, is the pressure on them, 2040, and we're running an inch and a quarter and one inch lines. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, it, yes. At the end of the longest run we have, we're getting about four gallons per minute. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. that's, and four gallons a minute's enough to stay ahead of them when they're out in the paddock drinking. Oh, yeah, easily. Now, if you yeah. forget to turn a tank on or something like that, whenever you move them, which happens once or twice a year for me, and if they flock the tank, then yeah, it doesn't keep up. But, yeah, they can't keep up. Yeah, right. but if you can keep it in with them, you're fine. Now, with your cattle, you also have sheep and other animals. Are you running mm -hmm. those with your cattle, or you run them separately? No, we run a pretty high stock density with our cows. I like to run 100,000 animal units to the acre or more. I like, especially if we've got tall grass, I'll run those animals at two to 300,000 pounds to the acre. And they're packed in there pretty tight. And I try to put the sheep in there and they use the sheep for footballs. They just, <laughs> they just push them out. What we've done is we'll take the sheep wherever they're needed. Oh yeah. The sheep will go wherever they're needed. And then we're running some mules and donkeys as well. And uh, now they're set on path, specific pastures because we bring them in during the daytime. And but they're still rotationally grazed as well. So those are not guardian animals. Those are separate animals. We do run donkeys with our sheep. They're used as guardian animals. We had some issues with guard dogs in the past. We've switched over to sheep, or no, yeah, we switched over to the donkeys. And we we really like the donkeys. Uh, they eat the same thing as the sheep. They move with the sheep. Normally, the they're the lead sheep that once the sheep get used to them, wherever the donkey goes, the sheep goes. And we're running the big donkeys. We're running donkeys close to 15 hands. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. And we ride them as well. We ride them. Oh, okay. Yeah. With the donkeys, have you gone 100% to, to donkeys from dogs, or do you still have any dogs out there? We don't have any dogs anymore. We've actually been through four flocks of sheep. In the first three flocks, we had dogs. And then there was a spell there for about a year and a half where we didn't have any sheep, but I have border collies. And I love my border collies, so I called a friend up and said, hey, you got three sheep that I can train with. And he says, I'll tell you what, I'll do one better. I'll sell you the whole flock. I bought the whole flock, and we've stuck with these sheep. And, man, I'll tell you what, you don't get much better sheep than what we have now. Oh, yes. There's, We've never wormed them. We've never trimmed a hoof we never had hoof rot uh, they're just a carefree sheep and before they were always full of parasites and you're treating for bottle jaw and trimming feet and all that we don't do none of that anymore oh yes you know so that Is makes it a nice. particular breed or did it come from a certain management that had valued those traits and bred for them? i'll tell you what it was cal my buddy he didn't like sheep they just ran, and it wasn't a very big flock. We're only talking 10 animals. But oh, yeah. he just left them run on his farm, and the ones that survived and the ones that didn't. And that's what made these sheep tough, at least I believe that's what made them tough. They weeded themselves oh, yeah. out. The only time he worked them sheep is whenever he was pulling lambs off to sell. That's the only time that those sheep got any attention at all. So they weeded themselves out, and we've had them, I think, now, this flock, probably, oh, four years, probably, somewhere in that neighborhood, and we've never lost an animal. Oh, yeah. yeah and Very be good. And before, yeah. we'd lose two, three, four sheep a year just to just different causes, and, and these guys here are tough. And as far as breed goes, the, the base breed is Katahdin um, with a little bit of Dorper in them, I think. And, oh yeah, and that's what I pretty much know about our sheep. <laughs> so they're not necessarily. I tell people they're sheep that live. That's the most profitable kind. Yeah, 
You got that right. <laughs> With your sheep, are you running them behind poly braid or using netting for them? Oh, no, we're not. If I had to run netting on a sheep, I don't think that we'd have sheep. It's The nettings, I know I have friends that use it and they swear by it and they love it. And for me, it's just a lot of work. I use a little bit of netting with goats, and it's mm. way too much work. I don't like it. Yeah, I don't care for it either. We use it to break animals to fence, but other than that, we don't use it. Uh, what we'll do is our sheep, we'll run them in one wire if the fencer is really running hot. And if it's drawed down to 7,000 volts, we'll, we'll run two wires to keep the sheep in. And we're using the nine-strand poly braid with three tin copper wire so they get a good snap yeah, if, metal. yeah so if they get a good snap if they get up against it and it works pretty good uh, we have lambs you have sheep you know how lambs like to get out they're always out you just gotta yeah. you just gotta turn your head and just let them go do their thing you know <laughs> they'll eventually get big enough to get zapped yeah <laughs> yeah it'll change their mind at that point yeah one thing you mentioned there about going to donkeys versus dogs the dog food is one of my biggest expenses yeah Jeez, i can't buy enough dog food for those dogs mm -hmm. and just that's just some a hassle to deal with we have a donkey with our sheep mm -hmm. now we ran into a problem with our donkey because i introduced a couple other donkeys on a property that's adjacent to my dad's property mm -hmm. we run the hair sheep on my dad's property so the property adjacent to it, I run cattle on, and I got a couple donkeys over there. Mm -hmm. That re that messed up our donkey in that he just wants to hang out on the fence with yep. those other donkeys. Yep. How well, do you manage that with multiple animals? It takes a pretty good donkey to be a guard animal. Not every donkey's going to make a guard animal. We find that Jennies usually work best. Oh, yes. Jacks are like the worst. They should never be used as guard animals. Uh they have that male tendency, and I think a jack donkey is probably the worst animal there is on a farm because uh, they can just turn on a dime and be nasty to you. Try to use jennies, and jennies that are usually in foal are going to have babies. They have that more of a mothering instinct, which seems to help. But you're right, certain donkeys, they will. If there's donkeys adjacent to them, they'll want to hang out with the donkeys versus hanging out with the sheep. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And we, our first donkey we have, it's a John, and we got him through the BLM program. Okay, yeah. Which we were like, we weren't sure. We thought we had this opportunity not too far from us. We're going to try it. And actually, we've been really impressed with him outside of, he wants to hang out with the other donkeys. So I have to make sure when I have them along that fence, they're not, both sides aren't along that fence. Yeah. And then the second thing is, he's too rough with baby lambs. Yeah, I've seen that. So, yeah. Yeah, I've seen that in the past. The John donkeys, they're fairly decent for the most part. Uh, but I do believe the Jennies are a little better. Is there anything special you do for grazing your donkeys and mules? The ones that we keep separate, we try to keep them in forage. It's a little bit too far gone. Oh, yeah. Because donkeys have the tendency to get fat uh, yes you know, they can get fat on you they can founder on you their feet grow funny i prefer to try and keep them in forage that's a little bit too far gone it's oh. pat way past the boot stage maybe even turning brown with seed heads on it is ideal actually actually that brings up a a good question jump back to cattle and sheep when you look at your flock or your herd and you're getting ready to move them and you've got different pastures how you decide where you're taking one versus the other um the sheep graze different from cows you know that and the cows do graze different from the sheep there's certain criteria that i look for the sheep if there's like woody species starting to grow a lot of forbs in there um if it's soils wet sheep work really well on wet soil yeah. because they're so light so that's where the sheep are at or they're in smaller areas where i really don't like riparian areas or areas to that nature and then the cows they're usually in grasses after the grasses start growing they're usually in three four three four foot tall grass all summer long oh yeah yeah very good 
Now, in addition to donkeys, sheep, cattle you also have some pigs yeah we farrowed hogs here when we first started our rotational grazing and and we got away from it Uh, we had the wrong breeds Uh, oh yeah they're heritage lard type hogs and the the meat was quality but the hams were small and the pork chops were small and we, we had a hard time selling them so we just got out of the hogs and we raised feeders. We've been raising feeder hogs uh, for a number of years now. And just this past fall, we've, we've got, we're going to start farrowing again. Oh, yes. And what breeds are you going with now? What we're using are red wattle hogs and Michon hogs. And then we're going to put a Berkshire on top of those to try and get oh, okay. the bigger hams and the bigger pork chops. Like the Michon hogs, they're just a, a medium-sized hog. And I'd rather feed a medium-sized sow that has, they're known to have 10, 12 babies at a time. So they're going to eat less, but they're going to have lots of babies. And I've put a Berkshire on them. We should have good quality meat. And the Michon are known for their quality meat. They're a lard-type hog, which makes the pork chops and the ham small. I'm familiar with Red Waddle Mm -hmm. and with Berks, but Michon or Michon, I'm not sure what those are. They're a black hog. I think they come in from China, actually. They're a medium-sized hog. They're they got real big floppy ears. They can't hardly see, and they're too lazy to root for the most part. Oh yes. Um, they just they're not a, a very active hog. Uh, they're very similar. We used to raise mule foot hogs, and they're very similar to the mule foot, but they're a little bit. I'd say they're. If you took a, a pot belly pig and a, a mule foot and crossed it, that's what the Michon looks like. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Where are you u- utilizing pigs on your farm? We put them in places that are poor because they do have, the, especially the red wattles, they have the tendency to want to root a little bit. Oh, yeah. So we do keep them out of pasture. We move them. We don't move them. Every day they get moved about every third day or so. And I have a a wagon that I built with a, it's a wagon with a hog pen on top of it. Okay. So we can actually, okay. we can run those hogs in and, and capture them every night if we want to. Because hogs, whenever it rains, it brings those earthworms up and they know there's earthworms. They'll just roll that sod up oh, crazy yeah. and it doesn't take them long and, that's one thing that drives me crazy is bare soil. So we'll lock them in whenever stuff like that happens. Oh, yes. And if you do get bare soil, what are you doing to the soil then? Are you are um, you planting anything? Um, we'll throw some oats on there, maybe some turnips. Uh, we used to do all a huge mix, 10, 12, 15 different species and put it on there. But I found that the seed in our soil's seed bank is there's a lot of seeds there and if you give it time and a little bit of rest they'll express themselves take care of itself yeah russ it's time for us to transition to our overgrazing section and we're just going to continue talking about pasture a little bit more Mm -hmm. on today on the overgrazing section we're going to talk a little bit about dealing with weeds and pasture oh tell us more about that yeah that's something that we've really worked hard on and we actually don't deal too much with the weeds anymore, cow. Uh, our big thing was is to just teach the animals to eat them. And we we do a, we did a catalog of the species on our farm, and I have 178 species of plants on our farm that that I've oh, wow. cataloged. The species is broad. And I've done a lot of forage testing because I had to prove stuff to myself in order to make things logical. And take, for instance, New England aster, it's high in zinc. Cut plants high in calcium. Each one of these plants have micronutrients that are beneficial to those animals. So if we can get them to eat them, it balances their ration out more. And I've found that we're not using many minerals anymore. The mineral, yes. our mineral consumption has went down. But prior to teaching the animals, we have to deal with these weeds one way or another because 
a lot of these weeds will reduce your production. And it's okay to have a horse nettle here and a milkweed here, but if you have a whole pasture full of it, your production's terrible. And we talked briefly about paddock shape earlier. We're not clipping anything on the farm. I haven't clipped a pasture since 2012. And that's one of the things with the NRCS grazing specialist. Him and I used to go back and forth all the time. I went to him. I'm like, I think I can manage these without having to clip my pastures. And he's like, oh, I think you're going to have to clip those pastures. And him and I went back and forth, and I proved it to him, and he doesn't clip his pastures anymore either. Oh, yes. (laughs) But um, to make it easy, what I'll do, we're fishing at set and fence now, so we'll just split those pat paddocks or we'll make our paddocks long ways in the pasture fields so they're long and narrow they may only be 10 10 feet wide but they may be 300 feet long and from the livestock moving back and forth they're what they don't eat they tramp into the ground and it cycle back quicker and like canadian thistles our cows have come to they absolutely love canadian thistle now and In teaching these animals, I didn't do anything special. The only thing that I did is we put them in a high stock density situation. And whenever you put those animals in a high stock density situation, they become competitive eaters. They're going to eat that plant because they're afraid their buddy next to them is going to eat that plant. And after they eat those plants for a while, I have cows that actually eat bull thistles now. Take, for instance, Canadian thistle. What I would do is I would put a pad or a fence around Canadian thistle patch is usually round. That's how it usually grows. And I would just take a, a fence and put around that patch of Canadian thistle. I'd run the whole herd in there. They would be in there like sardines. They'd be packed tight. And I'd leave them there for 30 minutes. And they would eat the Canadian thistle down. But what they did was they put compaction on the roots of those Canadian thistles. So they set those plants back enough that the grasses and the other plants could compete with them. Oh, yes. Yeah, and in the next graze, you'd come around, there'd be grasses in there, and you're not going to get rid of all the Canadian thistles. It's just not happening. Even if you're spraying them, you're not going to get rid of them all. But we set them back right. enough. We set them back enough that the livestock can, we set them back enough to where the, the other species in the the desirable species in the pasture field uh, was able to start growing. On Canadian thistles, last year on this lease property, there's an area that's got tons of them. Mm -hmm. And I had a red article on Mm -hmm. pasture.com about training your cows to eat them. I thought, I'm going to go and do that. So so I've read the article, or actually, I think she's got an e-book there. Mm -hmm. Read the e-book. I'm thinking, I'm going to go through the process. And you get a few things that they're not familiar with, and then you cut them, and you're training them to eat those. I'm gathering the knowledge, and I'm talking to my wife. I need to get some of this. And I go up there, and I put them in that area, and they had, and I, I go up there later. They ate all those Canadian thistles. They didn't eat them to the ground, but they chopped off all those seed heads and just went through them. I'm like, here I am trying to figure out how I'm going to get them to eat it. And all I had to do was put, put them, them in there. there. Yep. And um, I'm not sure. I didn't observe them doing it. So I don't know if it's just one or two animals that's doing it. And maybe the others will learn. I know I'm not using as high a density as you are. Mm-hmm. But I was, I was making it much harder than I needed to. You know, oftentimes as human beings, we way overcomplicate things. Cal. One of my mottos is keep it simple because I'll, I'll be explaining something to my wife or one of my kids or something. They'll like, Dad, you're overthinking it. You got to back up a little bit and rethink the process. And talking about weeds, our cows eat milkweed, uh, horse nettle, hemp dog vein. Every plant that's on our farm, they will eat. Now, they, oh, mu- yeah. they won't necessarily eat it to the ground. Some of those plants are toxic. And, but being that they're diluted in their rations, they're safe. Like I tell people, if you have a bottle of medicine, you take a pill, it's medicine. 
but if you take the whole bottle, it's poison. And that's what it's right. like with a lot of these toxic weeds. That I, in my opinion, I think alfalfa is more toxic than some of these weeds because you put a oh, herd, yeah. you put a herd of cows in on a 100% stand of alfalfa, you're gonna you're gonna have a bunch of bloaters. Yeah. Yeah, that medicine bottle is a good example of that because if you take just a little bit, you're fine. It's going to help you out. There's some benefit mm -hmm. from it, but you take the whole bottle, you got problems. Oh, yeah, big problems. Yeah. If you have one that's out there, just picking just that specific plant, but that's not normally the case. One thing you mentioned there was you went through and cataloged all your species. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about the process you did to do that and how you recorded that and kept track of it. Plant ID has always been a thing since I've been a kid. I probably knew every tree that was in a forest when I was six or seven years old. That was just a thing for me. And plant identification has been a huge thing. If I didn't know what it was, I'd be looking it up. And then we have cell phones now, which are, that, that's just like having a dictionary in your pocket or yeah. an encyclopedia. So... I'm not able to identify something, I'll run it through Google, and Google will most generally tell you what it is. Over the period of time, we've done a lot of diverse cover crops, and we had a ton of, we've done a lot of uh, diversity, because I've seen huge benefits in diversity. I started cataloging the different species of plants that we have. Are you keeping a list, like, on your phone or on a computer? Yeah, I have a list on the, on a computer. And one of the things that sparked me to do this is in the state of Pennsylvania, we have 11 native prairies. And the one prairie, oh, yes. and, and the one prairie, I think they're at like 212 species or something like that on 20 acres. And I visited that prairie and I mean, it's, it's a booming ecological system. It's just so productive and so beautiful. And so I've started Calgary cataloging the plants on our farm as well. Oh, very good. And another thing you said, talking about getting your cows to eat the weeds, you talked about the density gets them to be very competitive mm -hmm. in going after that grass. Is there a certain breaking point you've identified as to what density they really start doing that more? Usually about 250,000 pounds. That, and you don't have to do it all the time, Cal. If you're somebody that works off the farm, and most uh, producers work off the farm, and do it on the weekends. If you're home for a couple days, put your cows in a high stock density situation, move them four times a day or something, and then take them back out of that. Because it doesn't take no, that no. long. It may take, you, it may take you a little longer to teach those animals, but you still right. will be able to do that over a period of time. Yeah, great advice there. If you're working off the farm, utilize that weekend time to do some of that. Oh, yeah. I I have not done any high density grazing. I don't even I haven't even calculated my density because I know it's so low. That's something as I look forward to this year is trying to do a little bit higher density grazing. At one time we needed. At one time we and we still do it. If we see that we need to really jump start a system we ran 800,000 pounds to the acre. And we did it as a demonstration is what got me to doing this. We did it as a demonstration because we have field days just about every year on our farm that people can come and we get speakers and all that. But one of the demonstrations was to put cows at 800,000 pounds and then we had them at 400,000 and then we took them down and so on and so forth. But two years after that 800,000 pounds, you could still see the growth. It was that, oh, yes. that little piece of soil was so much better than everything else. It was just simply amazing. But those cows was only in there for 20 minutes. Okay. They're packed in there. They're in there for 20 minutes. So we went and we got flags, like for marking gas lines and stuff. Oh, yeah. We got 500 flags, and we went out and we started marking manure and urine spots. And on that tenth of an acre, we ran out of flags and wasn't able to mark them all. And those animals was only in there for 20 minutes. Oh, wow. That's the distribution of the manure and urine that we had. 
and soil cycling there's it was amazing it was amazing and we still do it oh yeah i wouldn't recommend anybody to do it to their whole farm in a year because it drive you crazy <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah it's a good experiment to try and mm. uh, one of the books i'm reading about is sometimes we need to frame things as experiments so we're not as afraid to fail when we try stuff oh yeah absolutely i one of my slides and some of the presentations i do it the one slide it says let's make better mistakes tomorrow oh yeah that's how we learn is is with our it is yeah you, you can't Except, be afraid yeah sometimes that's difficult because you're we've been trained for so long you gotta get it right and some of us are perfectionists mm -hmm. my wife would tell me right off i'm not i try <laughs> yeah yeah russ really have enjoyed the conversation but it's time we transition and i listen to the podcast and i learn i use transition every time i need a thesaurus <laughs> to look up some other words anyway time for us to transition to our famous four questions same four questions we ask of all of our guests <laughs> our very first question what is your favorite grazing grass related book or resource? Do I have to just pick one? You can list as many as you want okay. and we'll keep them on here. We'll, we'll list the, my top three. Okay. Um, one's a textbook. It's nature. Let me see here. It's on my desk. The nature and properties of soil as a textbook. And then a book by Johann Zeitzman, man, Cattle and Veld, that's like a, that is a really good book. And then a magazine, Stockman Grass Farmer. Stockman Grass Farmer, there's articles in there from farmers, teaching farmers, and there's a lot of good stuff there. There is excellent resources there. I'm not familiar with that textbook, Nature and Property of Soil, mm -hmm. but it sounds like one that would benefit me to be familiar with it. Yeah, it goes into microbes and how they're working in the system and, and that part of the soil that us farmers really don't know much about. Yeah, just on that, I don't know why I was thinking about this earlier, but so many farmers are just focused on their livestock and not the grass, and then you really get deeper than it's the soil health and what's going on there. Yeah, and, and that's what we did when we were first started, we were focused on the livestock and we weren't focusing on the grass. And whenever we flipped that, everything got better. Everything's got oh. really good. Our second question, what is your favorite tool for the farm? It would have to be my side-by-side. -side. That's my moving office. I have everything on it that I need out in the field. If I need a hose washer, it's there. If I need a pair of pliers, it's on that rig. Um, I built countless things for on it uh, things uh, i have uh, a fence jumper on it i don't put down fences i just run them over i have uh, oh, yeah. a reel holder on it so it holds the reel and i can set the fence as i go and i have a reel winder and then i put all kinds of lights on it and yeah you, you name it it's been it that's my tool that's that's my tool very good. Our third question, what would you tell someone just getting started? That's a great question, Cal, because I'd hate folks for folks to make the same mistakes that I did, and, and I see a lot of other folks making these same mistakes. Whenever I started, I spent a ton of money on equipment and trying to get everything that I needed. Try not to get too much in debt. That's where you're going to, where it's going to hurt the hardest. Even if it's just leasing a piece of property and running stalkers for somebody to get you started, that is probably the best way to get started in the grazing world. And it's not that hard. There's always somebody looking for somebody to graze cows. And a lot of times these, there's properties out there that if you go in and you explain to the landowner what you're going to do, they'll get excited about it and it's doable. Actually, my wife and I had a, a short conversation along those lines earlier in that I'd mentioned this place that I found that's not being used. I've got to contact the owner. Mm -hmm. I've, it's a little ways from my house, but I found it and I thought I got to contact him and see. And I said, if I could get that lease, she says, we don't have enough cattle for that. I said, oh, we can find cattle. That's not a problem. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we can. 
Yep. And Russ, lastly, where can other people find out more about you? I can't hide anywhere, Tal. I, uh, I figure you could. I, I, I can't hide anywhere. You can check my website out. It's www.russwilson.net. I also have a YouTube channel. I have pushing, I think, 275 videos or something like that. Just do a search Russ Wilson grazing because if you do just Russ Wilson, uh, the quarterback from whichever football team he plays oh. for comes up. Yes. You know, just – and you can actually just Google me, Russ Wilson Grazing, and I'll pop up. And uh, I also write for Stockman Grass Farmer as well. So you can find my articles in Stockman Grass Farmer. Very good. Russ, we really appreciate you coming on and sharing with us today. Oh, thanks for having me, Cal. It's, it's great to, to be able to share knowledge. And my main goal is to help farms become more profitable so many times I see farms are just struggling and the folks are just miserable. And if I can help one or two farms a year become more profitable, I've done my job. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's a, a worthy goal. Mm -hmm. We can just help a few get there. Yep.